Okay, well, welcome again, everybody. And i um, really happy to have everybody joined uh, here tonight. And um, look, at the end of the day, this is all about education and development. And so we're, we're really excited that uh, everybody made some time tonight out of your busy schedule to do this. So um, again, we, we already went over the ground rules. So um, maybe just a quick opening, I'll throw it over to Steve and then we'll just open the floor for questions. Um, I think when I wrote the year round throwing manual uh, about five or six years ago, what was interesting is I had a player that was priming for the draft in about 12 months. And I had a chance to watch everything that he had to go through for 12 months um, from showcases to area codes, to fall ball, to scout ball, uh, to navigating the, the holidays into the spring. Um, it was 12 months of, it was an eye-opening experience for me, even though I feel like I already had a pretty good feel for what's going on out there. And so that was sort of the uh, impetus for me writing the throwing manual. Um, but it seems like every, every summer when it comes around, it's a very confusing time. And there's just a lot of ambiguity. Um, so uh, Steve and I, as we, we talked about earlier, we, we did this really cool YouTube video where, where for about an hour, we just broke, broke this whole thing down. Um, but we thought it'd be very cool to sort of create an environment more organically where um, we had, you know, fellow baseball community friends jump in and ask some questions. And so, um, so again, feel free to ask any question about anything to do with throwing, arm care, summer ball, stopping and starting, not stopping and starting, which is what we're going to recommend you do, um, shutting down versus training. Those are some of the main topics. And then before we get going, Steve, did you want to add anything at all? Just again, that I'm super uh, excited and thankful to be here. You know, this is a topic that I'm passionate about. I live it every day as a high school coach and a father of a well, I guess he's a rising sophomore now, a 2025 pitcher. Um, so I've been a huge advocate and supporter of Allen's methods, his J-bands, his throwing manual since my guy was little. Um, knock on some wood, we're, we're doing well right now. We're going to continue pushing down that path. Uh, but just, again, super excited to be here tonight. And I'll, thanks, Steve. And I'll say one last thing before we get going. Uh, the reason Steve and I met is he reached out to me on Twitter and sent me a DM and he was trying to plot out whether it was the fall or the winter or the spring. He was trying to get three, four, five, six months ahead of the game and, and very detail oriented. And he had me look over his stuff. And it's ironic that's how we met. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to really collaborate on this because he's been knee deep in this for a while. <clears throat> and he's proof positive of what happens when you really have an idea of how to plot out the next, not just month, but three, five, six months. And, uh, and that doesn't include just going forward. You have to also reverse engineer and go, well, that is reverse engineering. You also have to look backward sometimes six months to, to really figure out where you need to go. So with that said, we're going to open the floor. And again, thanks to everybody for joining. And um, if you have a question, just feel free to raise your hand and, um, and then we'll have you unmute, your, unmute yourself and we'll rock and roll. Looks like John's ready. Fire yeah, I, thanks for hosting. Um, obviously this is first time I've been on a Zoom call on my phone. So I hope y'all can hear me. Uh, Texas guy, you probably can tell by my accent. Um, oh, I'm navigating what I believe to be a particular problem um, I have two sons, 13 years apart, okay? I'm a father of five, three girls, two boys. Oldest uh, made it to the bigs, did not stay there long, okay? Um, injuries. Um, and if you just look back on what we did um, through all the summers, the falls, um, big advocate of Allen's program. Um, I mean, I've got everybody on our team with Jaggermans, and we've been working nonstop with that kind of program for a long, long time. Um, long toss, things like that. What I don't want to do is repeat um, with my younger 13-year-old who, as I mentioned earlier, is the Lord has blessed him uh, tremendously. The left, left arm, he's already out to 85 yards, long tossing at 13, and that's not wind-aided. That's not daddy talk. That's true. 
Um, so we've got something that we have to navigate. We have to manage. And my biggest problem I have is fast forward to when he gets to high school. He's a seventh grader right now. We live in a rural district, all right? Small school. I really believe he's going to come in as his older brother did as a 14, 15 year old, make an impact on the program. I mean, he's throwing really hard right now. He's gained five to six miles an hour every single year. So he's going to be in the low 80s as a freshman. No one in the district even throws that hard. So I, I feel he's going to be one of the guys at, at early on. But my problem is, what do you do for the summers? If he, if he comes in, and I don't care if he's a sophomore, junior, or whatever, what if he logs 80 innings for his high school team? Do you continue on and, and pitch for summer ball and just add up innings? Or is it better to – get it to really work on your body, your mental, um, get stronger, bigger, instead of putting piling up all these innings. Because what I do know, I think the research, is, there's plenty of articles on this that, you know, Tommy John and shoulder problems have really, really started uh, coming around as we chase velocity. Everyone's chasing velocity right now. Everyone's trying to be the big arm. And if you go back in the 70s and 80s and things like that, those guys, they played during the season. You know, they, 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 they played baseball during the season. They played football. They played basketball. They took extended periods, times off uh, from throwing at high velocities. So my question is, as a young guy that's, that's navigating, do you just keep on pitching and being the ace of your summer team and just logging innings after innings all freaking summer long? Or do you take time off and, and, and play sport to sport? What are y'all's thoughts? Yeah, number one, it's a great way to start the conversation because it covers a lot of rich territory. Um, number, first of all, I would say this. Um, anybody that throws a lot in the spring, like a lot, as far as I'm concerned, especially if they're a, a eighth, ninth, tenth graders, I would have them go straight into training, conditioning, you know, maybe doing some deload and some rest and, uh, and prime them for the summer to use that as a real training buildup period. Um, it's a little different if they're a junior or senior where let's say they threw 40 or 50 innings in the spring, but they didn't have a real heavy winter leading into the spring. I have no problem with them just continuing on and, and pitched right through the summer because to me they're they're in shape and they're in three months of spring baseball is not that taxing um so i think that the answer is it depends i think in your case uh if your son is only going to be a freshman and he's already thrown 50 plus innings um i'd absolutely go more into training you know some shim. there's there's a basic cycle that we we have all the we think all the players need to go through that is performance into a deload, into rest, into active rest, into buildup. And in the case of your son, I would say he, he might wanna go into a deload mode, maybe rest a bit, do a little active rest, and then start the buildup process and, uh, and train. And also we're all about other sports because we just feel like at the end of the day, you know, diversifying your body and mind is just so powerful. So, um, those are sort of two main answers I'd give you on that. You know, yes, play other sports, but look, it's also not as easy as that. If you play another sport, let's say all summer long, like soccer, and you don't do anything for your upper body, your arm, so to speak, for three months, well, I think that's, it's an, that's an issue too. In other words, maybe you only play catch three times a week out to 90 feet and do some band work, you know, four or five times a week. Um, so there's sort of a, it's not an easy, that's why this topic is so cool. There's just so much going on <laughs> with, but I, I guess just to keep it super simple, number one is know the maturity, the age, the physique of your son or daughter. Um, two, look backward three to six months. How, how hard have they gone leading into this moment? And then number three, based on where you're at, you know, make a very educated decision of how much your son or daughter should pitch in the summer. Uh, it doesn't mean they, they can't play another sport either. I would just say that there's a, there's a, there's a balancing act going on. Does, does that help kind of resolve the question? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it helps. And it's just, I, I, what I find difficult is, you know, again, he's a seventh grader. He's not a freshman. So we got these select teams in Texas. We're all in these high powered major teams. And, you know, he's, 
the ace and they want to ride him as far as they can. And I want to back it off to where I don't, I don't want you to throw, I want to use everybody on the team. Why, why just, you know, why run him out there more than anyone else? And I, I can foresee, I felt we ran into some problems with my older one when he was pitching in high school and he was such like one year he did 90 innings in this high school and we in texas we play a long time we, we start in january okay and we go and they're still going to state championships for this week all right and so you know we were running deep in the playoffs so he would he did 90 innings for his high school team then we're right off playing for the houston banditos and trying to get scouted and be drafted and man his arm was tired and he was not very good and so my, my feeling is is there an inning limit at certain ages that if you exceed that in your high school season, you shouldn't pitch in summer? I guess that's my question. Should I, should I say, you know, hey, Texas Sticks or Dallas Tigers or whatever, we're not playing. He can hit, but he can't pitch. And that's not going to go over well knowing where he's going. Is that, I hope that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, here's how I'd kind of summarize. And then, Steve, if you have anything to add. Yeah, definitely. Add, and, then, and then we'll, we'll, We'll make sure we get to the, the next question. Here, here's sort of my, my deep, strong sentiment. Number one, I believe the National Pitching Association, um, NPA, and there's probably another one I can't remember that uh, Clayton Kershaw, I believe, is involved with through Major League Baseball, but they definitely have innings recommendations. Now, part of that to me could also be maybe too conservative. I don't know. I'm just saying that if you go there, I can almost guarantee you that if you break the 40 to 50 inning threshold for an arm that's under 15, um, there's no question the summer should be a rest and or training time period end of conversation. So the second thing I'll say is this, that I hope gives you some peace of mind as a parent, because I've done this for a really, really long time. Um, thank you, Steve. Steve mentioned also pitch smart. Um, but I'll tell you something else that I've done I've had this conversation for many years with parents. You have to stick to your guns, meaning it doesn't matter what coach A or B or C says. It doesn't matter what a scout says. The, your arm is the boss. Your arm dictates where you're at. You as a parent dictates where your son or daughter is at. So you have to follow your plan and your process independent of what you think other people may say or feel. That's black and white. I dealt with this from players at your son's level. And as you know, there's uh, going into professional baseball, going into college baseball. And we build a program with players that has a lot to do with them listening to their arm and feeling, feeling their way through this. And that, that wins, you know, uh, I'll, I'll steal a line from my buddy, uh, bomb, uh, bomber up at uh, Sac city, you know, and I put it in my throwing manual, your, your arm is the boss. So, uh, I think just to put a, 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 to tie this thing together so we'll move on to another question is this. Follow the guidelines of not only what the medical community is saying out there, but stick to your guns as a parent and do what's best for your son. I, I, we used to do, a, sorry, last thing, and then I'm going to get Coach Smeal out here. We used to do a summer camp and the bro... This is when I first started 30 years ago. In the summer camp, this is 30 years ago, a little six-fold brochure, eight and a half by 11 trifold. And when you opened up, Tim, if you can, I'm sorry, can you please mute yourself? Thanks, buddy. Um, on the trifold, it said, the summer is for training, not playing. That's 30 plus years ago. Now that doesn't mean it applies to everybody that you can't play in the summer. But when I think about the greatest violinists in the world and the greatest piano players and the greatest ballerinas, they're, this is 80 hours a week or whatever it is of training. They're not performing that much, right? And, I'm, and there's nothing against playing summer ball, but they're training. And I am from a training background. And I believe if you want the most out of training and development, you plug into that and you pick your spots where you want to perform and, and play. And there's no, and obviously do that. Um, but I would focus more on, it's almost, I don't know what the numbers would be, but my gut tells me it's sort of like two thirds training, one third playing. 
as a pitcher, position player, you could probably get away with playing year round a lot easier. So, Steve, do you want to add anything, and then we'll turn it. Yeah, back let me. Add, group, I'll please. add wrap that up a little bit, and then we'll go. Uh, we'll we'll get into the next question. And John, our DMs are always open if you if you want to get that. I feel like I can connect with you on some things there. So one of my roles at the high school level is a pitching coordinator for, you know, our entire program from top to bottom at high school. And when you look at that, you know, pitch count got pitch counts, the initial guide that we use, that's just for, you know, Hey, hey you know, that, that guy's going out for that outing, but we got to know how long they build up. So John, I would really steer you more towards the, what Alan refers to in his book as the different seasons, the deload, the rest, the active rest, the buildup, because it's going to depend on what season he's in and how long he's been in that. So if he's in an in-game season from in, in, in here in Georgia, we are January 15th to about mid to end of May for our season for high school, you know, that's in season. Um, hopefully they're pitching once a week max. There's good pitch counts on them. They're at a slow tiered buildup as they go through that. As they start approaching that 50 inning mark, 60 inning mark, you know, hopefully we got other guys down the road that we're using too. Um, so that's one thing. The the other, so really look at that, the season that you're in because you can't stay 52 weeks in season. You gotta, there's gotta be some ups and downs in there. The other one would be uh, listen to the arm. He's got to know if he, I heard him. I heard you say he's feeling tired. He's feeling that to me says, hey, we need to start going down. Um, I'm a parent like you. I, I've got that same thing. We want to put the situation, want to put him in the best situation. Hey, just one more showcase or, hey, this team called. They want him to pitch or they want this. Um, consider role changes. Um, so if he was a starter in high school, say, you know what, this summer, he's he's a reliever. He's a one to two inning guy. That's it. That's all he can do. He's got a 40 pitch count max. That's all he's doing. So maybe consider a role change uh, from there. Um, and then the other thing is just nobody – He's got to, he's the, the more we can get him to take ownership of his arm, the better we're going to be, but nobody else cares as much about his arm as him and you. So you make sure you lay out that 52 week program and start getting a little more active with that. If you're not already. And I think that'll really help you to be able to say, you know what? Hey, uh, we can't do it. I got, I got a call today. I got a call today about something and it does, it's starting to interfere with what our original goal was. It's another showcase. It's a big one. It's a, and I said, you know what, we're going to look at it as a family, but as of right now, if I had to make a decision, it's probably going to be a no. And the no is going to be it's travel again. It's more innings on the arm. It's just, we already got a lot of exposure. There's a certain time where we got to kind of, kind of come back down a little bit. Steve, that's just, so cool and from a father's perspective who's living this that was really insightful and powerful so thank you and and as as steve said you can dm us offline as well and we can try to fill in some more blanks but i think steve would be a great resource for you as well john um brian i see a hand up so brian we're going to go to you big boy okay so um to kind of spin off of what um, we just heard, you know, same thing in Texas. You know, fortunately, Sammy's got plenty of innings. You know, he didn't pitch in the spring, so it's not about him. But one of his teammates, now imagine if you're the coach, um, he's still pitching going into uh, the state finals. Um, we're about to start our summer season this weekend. Um, he has a history of arm pain and injury, and he's a rising senior. How do you handle them this summer if you're the coach? Well, first of all, you said the magic word. You said the word pain. To me, you just can't have a, bit, a bigger red flag, right? So unless I misunderstood you, if I heard the word pain correctly, anytime I get a call from someone that soreness is a little different, soreness usually you can work through. It's not, it's not really an, an issue or it could become an issue. But pain to me... And maybe you meant soreness, but pain to me is just a red flag. It's a stop. It's a stop. Well, no, it's a, it's a, it's a history of pain. Every other year he's pitched in the summer, he's had pain and injury issues. And so now we're going into that rising senior year. He's pitching deep into the year. What do we do with him? Look, I've had this conversation, I guess when you've been doing this a long time, you can say you've had this conversation a million times, but I've had this conversation a million times. Um, 
when it comes to any kind of injury in any sport, I always say the same thing. You have to eliminate the calendar, okay? Because it could be a very important season in the spring or the summer or the fall. There's always important things going on. You eliminate the calendar. You go straight into prep. Well, first of all, you go straight into healing mode, right? And get right and build up and train and get super healthy. Because I, I hope this resonates with, with you guys on the call here. Um, I've always, this has always worked with players when I've used this, this psychology. Think of this more over the next two to four years and technically the next 10 to 20 years. Where do you want to be two to four years from now? Well, if you really think about where you want to be two to four years from now, and again, I mean 10 to 20 years from now, everything's a moot point right now. All that matters is that you get better and 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 healthier and healthier and stronger and stronger, whether that's four innings a year or 60. I don't know. But if you're in pain, it's just a red flag saying, and you have a history even more so, so you know there's a point of reference. And I know you know this, Brian, so I'm just speaking out loud. But if I, if I was this player's father, this is such a no-brainer. This is immediately stop, you're in pain. We need to figure out what's wrong. We need to build you up and get you so healthy and strong that when we can show you at your peak healthy strongness, which is not a word, then whether that happens to be in your spring season or the fall showcase, we'll show you great. You're gonna be great. That's how I wanna show you. And if this is a year, believe me, I've had a lot of players that are going through TJ or coming back from TJ where they're trying to make a major league team in spring training or they're in the middle of the season or maybe it's a contract year, or who knows? Or it's a scholarship year as a junior or senior in high school. And it's really, really tough to, to, to unpack that and put the brakes on. But what I always try to get the player to do and the, obviously the parents to do is to just buy into one thing, which is nothing matters except you got to get healthy, strong, and right and eliminate the calendar. You're, you'll get there when you get there. Yes, you may miss an important season. You may miss an important showcase. You may have to go to a junior college instead. You may not get drafted because of it. But if we can get you to where you're the best version of yourself, you'll be where you're supposed to be. Meaning if you're going to be a first round pick, you'll be a first round pick. If you're going to be a 12th round pick, you're going to be a 12th round pick. If you get a college scholarship, you'll get a college scholarship. It might be a year later. But to me, this is a black and white issue. And Brian, it was a great question because it really covers a huge topic in general that we can all, I'm sure, relate to on this call. Steve, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just, um, I agree with the pain. You got to try to find a solution there, find, find where it's at, but a shutdown is good. Again, I go back to my other thing. If for some reason it's not a shutdown and I've, I've dealt with that, I've got a, I've got a, a player on our team right now that's continuing to play. Um, our high school team is continuing to play. He had arm soreness when we had him in high school. He's got arm soreness now. I'm trying to shut him down and I see him swinging every day on Twitter and throwing. So um I, it's just not going to get better by, by continuing to, to put, to, to, to put stress on it. But the other thing I would say is just, I mean, I'm not, a, I don't, I know a little bit about them as much as you guys probably do, but you know, postgrads are becoming a, a little bit of a thing right now too. So that might be another option for somebody if, if they can't get through that season and get seen because it was their senior year um, or it's a rising senior year, they still got time. But if it's that's you know they already graduated, then they're maybe just not that not that time that maybe post grad might be an option for them. Good, I like it. Um, I'm going to go, Steve. I'm going to come to you in one sec. Um, James Min uh, through the chat sent us a, a, a question, so let's get to that, and then Steve, you're you're on deck, buddy. Okay. The question is, what are your thoughts on potential stress on an arm if the player goes from pitching to shortstop mid-game or vice versa? Player is a rising sophomore in high school. Love this question. I had Hunter Green, sorry to drop names, but uh, I think of Hunter a lot because Hunter was a shortstop in high school. And his dad and I, this is something we talked a lot about, um, you know, navigating 
playing short and pitching. Um, and clearly, like this sounds like this player, um, you know, there was a lot at stake. That's a lot at stake. It's always a lot at stake because you want to, first of all, you just want to be healthy so you can enjoy your career, whether you play in the big leagues or play in high school. You want to enjoy your experience. So it's, it's all relative. Um, but the fact is, I, I get this question also a lot with catchers going into pitch or pitchers going into catch, uh, which is clearly even more extreme. But the short answer, James, is this. If possible, it is always better to go from a position to the mound because your quote unquote arm, you did your pregame throwing, long toss, hopefully arm care. You're hot. You're in a good place with your arm. It doesn't mean you're quite in pitching shape. And yes, in a perfect world, it'd be to me borderline mandatory. I, I, I'm not going to say borderline. It'd be mandatory to get down to the mound, take the inning off of defense. A lot of schools, I think, permit that and, and obviously get a good bullpen in before. I even try to stretch my arm out with maybe extra bands and try to get some distance on a side field if I could. I mean, you talk about like thinking outside the box. Um, you want to try to get in a little bit of long toss if you actually could mid game. But if you're talking about going right from shortstop literally to the mound, um, to me, it's still better because once you come off a mound, even if you only get to the 15 pitch plateau, you know, and of course we're talking about a starter at 50 to 80 pitches, your arm starts going into that recovery mode, right? So let's say the swelling, as an example, I'm not a doctor, this is an Eric Cressy uh, question for him, but you know, as I know in old school terms, you know, once the arm starts, to, once the swelling process begins, um, it starts, let's say the arm starts to tighten up a bit, it's not the time to start throwing aggressively on it. Um, so I would say in a way, I would almost never want, I, if, a, if a player, maybe pitched 25, 30 pitches and it was low intent and not stressful innings. You know, kids that are younger are probably more supple. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just don't like going on record ever in, in, in supporting. I, I'm going to stay on record as that. I just would never want a player to go honestly from the mound to any position. Um, again, I think it just works a lot better the other way. Steve, anything on that? Yeah, we got a uh, – I'm assistant coach slash bench coach for a high school team. Our head coach is a 10-year big league guy, a 20-year minor league guy. So what we do is all that stuff's decided beforehand. So, example, we got a guy that's a draft guy, maybe first to third round. He's a shortstop. Well, he also is a flamethrower on a hill. So we don't – when he pitches, he's a pitcher DH. So if he goes out there and gets shelled and comes out in the second inning – He's inside the dugout. All he's doing is hitting. I don't know if you guys have those same rules. We have that in Georgia, but he never takes the field again. Okay. His other option is if we, we use him as a closer. So if he's playing short, then if he's playing short, we'll bring him in in between the innings, we'll get him warm um, and then put him in on the hill and he can close out the game. So, but either way, we try not to. Uh, fortunately, we don't have a catcher that pitches. So we don't have to deal with that at this point. Um, but I know that's another one. Again, I would be with Alan too. I don't like them to, I don't like them to pitch and go play another position. Yeah, and I think to put a, a, a cap on that, and then Steve, we'll get to you. I, and and again, we'll try to be relatively brief with these answers so we can get to everybody. Um, I just would say, as a rule of thumb, just to never do it. Um, you know, just going from pitching to a position is just asking for trouble. You know, for one game, is it worth your career? I mean, I guess that's just the simplest way to put it. Um, and I just want to reinforce this comment, which is if you are a position player and you're going to pitch, um, I, again, I think with Hunter, he was able to come out an inning and not play defense. And I, I, from what I remember, I think there was a side field there and he actually was able to get some long toss in. But for sure, what I had him do is um, do the, you know, he did our band workout, but also I had him do the forward throwing motion with the J bands. And I had him do, one thing I love about the J-bands is there's a cuff in there you can put your fingers through. It's very comfortable, so it feels like you're throwing. And so I had him do, instead of like 15 or 20 quickies, you know, like you might do coming out of a bullpen, you know, I had him maybe do two sets of 20 or, or, or so and, and really open the arm up and just do a, a lot of heat and get and sort of get a mini long toss in in the arm 
just by doing a lot of reps of the forward throws. I wasn't worried about him being tired on the mound. I wanted him to be super, super hot and super, super protected. And again, that was just another reason why that was such a, uh, a key thing for him to do, to, to get that throwing in and get that band work in before he took the mound. Uh, thanks for the question, James. That was a good one. Uh, Steve, you're up, buddy. Okay, thank you. Um, what advice would you give to young players who have high school coaches or summer ball coaches whose arm care or training methodologies differ from that that the players used to? Uh, an example, a coach, a high school coach that doesn't want his players going out beyond 120 feet, that has a prescribed number of throws, a prescribed time to throw at each distance out to 120 feet, or uh, a coach that uh, requires, if you will, use of a, a different type of training band in terms of arm care. What, what advice would you give in terms of the player advocating for themselves without coming across as looking like they have to do it their own way? Do you, do you understand the question? Or did oh, I, did do I understand the question? Okay. Um, I would say for a good 20 to 25 years, you know, I've been an advocate of long toss and throwing with a lot of arc and throwing the ball, basically letting the athlete do whatever the athlete wants to do and, and, and being individualized. So it's gotten just miraculous. I don't want to say miraculous. It's just gotten so much better now. It's almost like all the major league teams are pretty much now open to long toss and freedom to do what you want. And that includes what, what bands you want to use or weighted balls or not weighted balls. And so I have a lot of experience with this, Steve, and I've had, and I went through a lot of frustration, which was part of the grist for the mill for me. It was part of why I had so much fire uh, because we had a lot of players we trained that were restricted. And I thought it, it either ended their career or put them on a path to have a very short career. And um, so I have a lot of passion about this topic and I will give you some very black and white answers. I'm not saying this is the easiest thing to do, of course, because you're dealing with other people's opinions. You're dealing with people that are, are an authority, right? It's their program or their team. Um, but if it's my, I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to if it's my son, um, uh, or daughter, um, something Steve kind of said earlier, their, their health is the priority, right? Their career is the priority. My, my play, my kid is going to be with this coach for either maybe a summer or maybe even a few years in high school, whatever the number is, but he's going to be on his own for the rest of his life. So I want to make sure that he does this right the first time. I, I don't want any mistakes. And if I know of a program, whether it's long toss, weighted balls, not weighted balls, plyos, not plyos, core velocity belts, wrist weights, throwing 500 feet or throwing 50 feet. If we have a system in place that is works really well, um, your arm is the boss, your body is the boss, your mind is the boss. At this point, this comes down to standing your ground and doing what's best for you. So I know this sounds very extreme, um, but I would not let my son, I mean, we can get into the whole topic of, you know, you, you get dealt with adversity, it's good to deal with adversity. Well, it's good to deal with adversity to a degree, but if it ruins my son's career, that's not a good lesson. So I come from a very hard line, extreme approach. I do not want my son or daughter unnecessarily injured and ruined because someone else had a plan and was not interested in my son or daughter's plan, especially if their plan is a really well thought out plan that has a lot of history of success. Now, with that said, you have a couple of choices. One is, is if your son's old enough or daughter's old enough to, to, to to, to meet with the coach and the coach is open-minded, that's the first place to start. The second place is the parent may have to intervene and say, look, this is what we do and why. You can bring some articles, you can bring some literature, um, you can show the people that are doing this program, um, but you can say, look, this is what works for my child and this is what we need to do and we need to make sure time is allotted to do it. If they choose to not 
go want to go there with you. I don't want my son or daughter in that program, whether that's high school or whether that's a summer team. I want them. It's funny, Barry Zito's dad, when I first met Barry, um, it's really a cool story. Uh, Barry was at UC Santa Barbara. He was at a four-year school. He was a freshman All-American, I believe. But Joe was really intrigued with our, because we used to do a pro camp where we did all of our long toss, all of our band work, but we also did a ton of yoga and we did a ton of meditation. And Joe was really, really interested in all that. So I'm sorry, I'm getting a little off topic here, but it's, it's sort of driving the point home. And I'll never forget, Joe always said, I want to put Barry in what I feel is the best classroom for him. His dad, Joe, was a really, really shrewd guy. And he just used that term. And I thought that was an interesting term. He just felt like our program was the best classroom. It had nothing to do with Santa Barbara or, or Wichita State or Vanderbilt or Granada Hills High School. He just felt like this encompassed really what he, where he wanted his son to be. And he took his kid out of a four-year school at the time. So I just think, Steve, that at the end of the day, you have to be an advocate for your child. You have to be an advocate for what allows your child to thrive. And if you get, I'm just warning you, if you put your child in a situation that has restrictions, it's also very dangerous because when the body gets used to training a certain way, okay, I'll use long toss as an example. If an arm is used to going out to 300 feet, so it has a certain amount of range of motion, it has a certain amount of arm, uh, arm conditioning and endurance built in, it has a certain amount of variance in the release point built in, and then you shut it down to 120 feet as one example, it's a shock to the arm. It's a shock to the body, it's a shock to the mind. That to me is where injuries happen. When you take something that's elastic and fluid and in great shape, and you just shock it. You ever, you know, the thought of having a leg in a cast for six months and then coming out of the cast the day you get, you come out of the cast. Can you imagine if someone had to run a hard 90 the day you came out of a cast? That to me is an extreme example that drives this point home. That's what happens when you shock the arm and shock the body. And so again, not an easy navigation because you know, the coach may have strong opinions, but if you know, I have a saying, the truth always prevails. If you know the truth in the situation, the right way for your son or daughter to be training, then to me, you, 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 you can't deviate from the truth. And if that means something extreme, like going into a different program or a different high school, it's just something to consider. So I hope that helps you, Steve, as a, as a coach in a high school, I'm sure we'll have a, 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 a unique angle as well. Steve, what do you got? Yeah, we have uh, general recommendations, but we go to all of our guys and ask them what their program is. And generally what we hear is, um, you know, nothing, you know, or nothing. I, hey, what's your warm up program? They might have a little bit of this, but hey, what's your recovery program? They don't have anything. So we just make some recommendations and we always tell them, hey, if you have any pain at all, let us know. If you feel really good about something, let us know. If you try it, one of these exercises, you try something, you don't like the way it feels, let me know. We'll replace it with something different. Um, you know, we got guys that long toss. We got, got guys that don't go out that far, you know? So it just depends on, on the scenario of the player. Um, everybody's got one arm and it's built different. So they, they, you got to listen to that thing and you got to figure out, you know, what are we doing? Everyone's at different stages too. You know, if you think about the, the 52 week or the throwing manual, um, the guy showing up, could have had a really long six months and the other guy could have had just picked the ball up and didn't even build up. So, you know, we're in a, you know, prescribed or set throws or anything like that. That could be really dangerous. If I, you know, I, I can't go run a marathon right now if I'm not running. So that, that might be what we're asking that, that guy to do from a throwing standpoint. And I'll, I'll just, thank you, Steve. Awesome. And, and last thing, Steve, I would just add to, to, to what Steve just said is, at the end of the day, to me, a coach's job, this is his job, this is job 101, is to investigate each player as to what they do. It's to ask a lot of questions 
that's the, these are the best coaches to me, the ones that are open-minded, they're interested in what, what you do. Maybe you don't do anything. And then, so they need to, you know, they need to help integrate their plan. Um, but to me, that's always a concern um, when a coach has a sort of a plan in place, um, as opposed to, he can have a plan in place, but for me, it's just vital that you first go to the player as Steve said, and you just ask a bunch of questions and, and get a baseline of where that person's at. And, and then here's another word, collaborate. <laughs> collaborate, right? Um, so I hope that helps. Um, Tim, I know you're on deck. Steve, do you want to give a quick response to any of that? And then we'll get to Tim's question. Steve Israel, I'm sorry. Steve, did you have a quick no, that was very helpful. Um, my son is a rising junior, so that those are the kinds of things that you know he would is of an age where he'd need to approach the coach and have those conversations. He's not a real verbal kid, so sometimes he's kind of intimidated by the coaches, if you will. Um, not that they're doing anything to intimidate him; he's just intimidated by them as an authority figure. But I think those are great pieces of advice, um, and and I think that'll be very helpful for him to. I have those conversations with his coaches. So thank you. You got it. Communication and do your best to communicate. But if need be, you just have to stay on your ground because you, you, you'll, you'll be kicking yourself if you didn't want to ruffle feathers. And then if your son or daughter, God forbid, got hurt, right? That's just not, a, you wouldn't want to be there. So you have to be proactive and you have to say, look, whatever I got to do to make sure my son or daughter is healthy. I just have to do it. I, I, there, there's just not, to me, there's just no gray area. Like, I don't want to put my child in harm's way, especially if you have a formula that works. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks for the, it's a great question. Tim, you are up. You can uh, unmute yourself and fire away. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I have, I spent two weeks earlier this winter or earlier this spring really studying uh, long toss and you you know I've been doing my son's been doing off and on for years I put together what I thought great calendar and I'm really excited about it things have worked great uh, so far but as I look at the calendar I live in Iowa and December January February it's a challenge now I've seen my son go dang near just throw a snowmobile suit out and go out and throw and dang near anything but there's just those extreme weather situations you know maybe a month solid where I, I don't really have an answer for and then you mentioned you know the shock to the system of going from throwing 300 foot to throwing in a gym uh so any advice there on, on what we can do in the winter months? Yeah, number one, shoot me a DM on Twitter. I've written, I wrote an article called um, Throwing for Inclement Weather. And I go over a, a couple of really key ways to stay in shape for cold weather states. And then two, I'll try to, it's the summertime, it's tricky, but if you, if you can kind of Google on Twitter, or if you can search on Twitter, uh, inclement weather throwing, I, I've actually posted a couple of videos as well, but I'll give you the very short answer because I can send you those links that, that will really cover this. Number one is if you're in shape and you want to stay in shape and then you can't get outdoors, um, find it. If you can get to an in, indoor facility or even in a basement where you can even just throw into a mattress or throw into a net, the key is, is to get elevation you know, to get the same kind of range of motion uphill you would outdoors, yet you would get in long toss. So you just want to build uphill, just like a long toss session, and then you can build downhill. But the key is really to get the arm stretched out and opened up by going uphill. The other thing is that I have players do, we have players do is a lot more band work. So as an example, you go through a normal band workout. And like I said earlier with Hunter, where you do the forward throwing motion, because you can't get outside and long toss, maybe you do three sets of 25 forward throws. Each set of 25, by the way, is gonna allow the arm to feel more opened up and more opened up and more opened up. 
and you're getting in what I, what I would call a lot of great conditioning work. Um, one of the great substitutions for getting outside is endurance and volume. And to me, it's actually one of the keys to a healthy, strong arm. It's not always about throwing at 300 plus feet. Yes, that's, a, that's very important to us. Uh, but I would say as important is knowing the, the art of volume throwing, what we call low impact volume throwing. You may not be able to get past 90 feet or 120 feet, but you can throw in a way where your arm feels very loose and stretched. And maybe you can do that for 30, 30 minutes, like a, like a BP pitcher. That is another way to keep the arm in unbelievable shape, even if you can't long toss. A lot of extra band work, throwing uphill into a net, or even if you can only get to 90 to 120 feet, just throw in it with more of what we call a, a massage mentality, so with a stretching mentality, and do it for a while, and, and, and assuming you're in shape to do it. Um, so those are three huge things. But Send me a DM and, uh, and I'll send you a couple of links that, uh, especially that article, that article I think will, will really help you a lot, Tim. So hopefully that helped. Thank you for the question and we'll, uh, we'll kick it now back to, does anybody else have, come on, Ryan, what do you got there? You know, you got something, you got a burning question, nothing? Ken, you have anything? You good? Steve, did you have another question? Steve Israel, or is that the hand still up from before? <laughs> this is the hand from last time. Gotcha. Tanner, you got anything? What a picture. Kobe's yeah, maybe. Life. Huh? Are you supposed to pinch your scaps when you're using the, the J bands? Oh, goodness. That's a crest question for Eric Cressy um, or Ron Wolforth. Um, I've heard about scap loads for a long time. Um, I'm a, I'm a pretty old school in some ways, in many ways, sometimes as far as just, I'm a feel guy. I, I'm more into what feels good. I don't, I don't know a lot about scap loading. Uh, I've heard it talked about. Um, I think it's like a lot of things in life. Sometimes if you try to do something, um, the trying gets in the way. However, you can try to do something and it could also free you up. I think it just depends. So I, my answer is I don't really know, um, but I would say whatever feels, feels good. If you, if you scap load and do it and you feel like there's a, a benefit to it, do it. Um, but those are the kinds of things, you know, Twitter is amazing. You can go onto Twitter and send Eric Cressy or Alex Simone or Lance Wheeler. It's amazing how people will respond. So uh, maybe maybe throw out that question on Twitter to some of those guys and then hit me up and let me know what you got. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Ron Wolforth is, he's the first person I heard use that term scablo. This is probably 20 years ago, if not longer. And uh, that would be one of Ron's expertise. So I would say uh, Ron is the, uh, um, Texas baseball ranch, if that helps, if you want to, but, but go to Ron Wolforth or, or someone like an Eric Cressy. And uh, I'm actually curious, another good one. I'll tell you another one is Casey Fisk. He's at Casey Fisk PT. And um, Casey's someone I also lean on a lot. Randy Sullivan, speaking of someone I lean on a lot, the Armory, Florida Armory. Um, these people are, they're great. They'll get back to you, I think, right away. So hopefully that helps you, Tanner. Perfect. Um, that's so funny. I just went down to Texas Base around speaking of Mohammed Rolforth. That's, that's so funny, Ryan. Ron is a great guy. I go back. Ron and I, I knew we were kindred spirits when I met him at the ABCA convention Honestly, this had to be in the 90s. Some of you weren't even close to being born yet. And uh, he had a book called The Athletic Pitcher. That book is, if it's still around, I'm talking, well, man, of course it's still around, but I mean, if, if, if he's still, he's, he's written so much more since then. But I thought to myself, oh, I like this. This guy gets it. The Athletic Pitcher. Um, just something that I, I 
just really resonated with me that he wasn't so into perfect mechanics and you know ABC. He wanted to tap more into the athlete, which is what we're all about too. Anything else, Steve? Is there anything you can think that we might have missed or a, a pressing question or something you've been thinking about? I just know we uh, we talk a lot about uh, navigating the summer. That's kind of been our theme here as we were getting into summer a few weeks ago. Now we're in it. Uh, most everybody's in it. A couple tournaments or, you know, guys are in the Cape or there's still some college guys playing, that kind of stuff. Um, what, when are we going to start thinking about fall? When should we start mapping the fall out? Well, wow. I mean, it sort of depends on what happened in the spring, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, based on what happened in the spring, it depends on what your plans are in the fall. For some players, they have the luxury of showing up to campus, knowing they don't have to really be hot for maybe two months. Others are showing up to campus and they have to be hot <laughs> September 1st, or nowadays, who knows, August 15th. Um, so as you know, there's just a lot of variables, but I would basically say that I think the key to your question is, is just to be, be hyper alert that this is not just about navigating the summer. This is about where do I need to be when I go back to my high school or college? And what are the coaches' expectations there? And what does it look like the past few months leading into where I'm at so I can set up the fall the right way? And I think that's one of the big mistakes is that People get so focused on just how they get through the summer that they forget about the fall as a continuation of the summer, which the winter is a continuation of the fall and the spring is a continuation of the winter. <laughs> so that continuum to me is a big deal. And I guess I feel like that's, that's where I think people miss. And I'm, and I'm, I think it was a really smart question, Steve, because if nothing else, even though it's tough to answer it, it just brings awareness to people that, hey, there is more to it than a mid I'm starting to get into the summer. What, you know, I don't know, maybe someone's gassed two weeks into the summer and they have a big showcase in a month. As far as I'm concerned, that showcase is, is pretty much a done deal. I mean, you gotta, if you're gassed, you need to start going into that rest recovery buildup mode, you know, maybe for two, three months down the road. So uh, Someone else that had a light spring, maybe they're on fire going into the summer and then they're stronger now than ever. And they just wanna keep going. But if you do keep going heavy into the summer, again, are you going back to school where they're gonna expect you to be in a certain point, September 1st, thus October 1st, thus December 1st? And so I think a big piece of tonight in our YouTube video is to remind people that you have to look at this from a continuum of maybe even six to nine months going forward and not just six to nine days. <laughs> yep. Tim, fire away. We got Tim with a hand raise. Ryan, I know you're, I know you're thinking about something, Ryan. I can feel it, Ryan. Something's coming, right? No pressure, Ryan. Okay, Tim, you, you got the floor. I wonder if I could ask a question about pull downs. Um, it's the objective of pull downs is, I mean, basically to throw, to, to kind of throw downhill. Am I correct in that? Is, is that kind of the thought of you'd stretch it out and now you got to kind of gradually get your, I don't know what, what words I'm searching for, but you're trying to gradually throw it downhill. Is that correct? It is essentially, I'll add one piece to it. A true pull down, now not every day of course is a pull down. A true pull down simply means maintaining the intent. So I'm gonna use 300 feet as a simple okay. number. If, you, if you're out to 300 feet that day and it is a, you're in shape to pull down that day, as you come back into your partner, we generally come in about 10 feet, 10 to 15 feet of throw. But a true pull down is maintaining the intent of your furthest throw. So you're still throwing 300 feet at 280 and 240 and 190. 
The only thing that's changing, as you said, is the arc is getting lower. So the intent is the key. The question is, are you able to maintain the intent of your furthest throw that day? Now we, we're pretty lax from 300 feet, let's say to 200 feet. But once you get to about 200 to 180, that's when we want you know our, our players with a really good crow hop starting to get downhill okay. and, and maintaining the intent of the furthest throw. And I'll say one other thing about pull downs, Tim. I found this extremely helpful for, for players and coaches. Make sure you miss in front of your player's feet by 50 feet versus one foot over their head. It's very easy to throw the ball over the head. And also it's easy to decelerate on the way in and not maintain that intent because it's an art form on flat ground to get the ball lower and lower without decelerating. That's not easy to do. So most people ease up on the way in and don't really pull down. Yes. They, they sort of pull down. <laughs> so keep that in mind. When, you're, when your son is at 100 feet and he was out to 300 feet that day and he pulls down, here's the question to ask him. Would that last throw have gone 300 feet if we changed the arc to 35 degrees? And he should be able to say yes right away. And from my experience, most people don't truly know how to pull down correctly. They're pulling down sort of pretty pretty well. But uh, believe me, I've been around a lot of players and I've been in their ear at 70 feet after they went out to 300 feet. And they think, and the ball's coming out firm and it's crisp, but I can tell it's 90%. It's, it's good, but they're still decelerating. And we want the opposite. We want the acceleration. We want at least to maintain. And just a side note, I've actually done a video on this on Twitter as to why players that throw 350 feet and are only throwing 85 on the mound, why the velocity is not translating from long toss. This is a topic that comes up quite a bit. And I already know the answer. And every time I can remember that, given some of the answer, they've agreed with me like, oh yeah, you're right. We're not doing that. And this is what that is. When you go out to these big distances and you come back in, most players will decelerate on the way in because A, they don't really know what it means to accelerate or maintain that furthest throw. B, they don't want to play chase all day because they know if, if they maintain their arm strength as they get closer and closer or their effort, it's going to go over their partner's head. So that's one of the reasons why velocity is lost on the way back in. The 350 is greater, 250, whatever the distance is, is great for conditioning, endurance, athleticism, feel, conditioning, recovery. Like all these great things come out of the going out phase, the stretching out phase. But, and, and when you come in and pull down, that's still great. That's more athleticism. You are getting some explosiveness out of it. But to me, it's sort of like going from a brown belt to a black belt. There's a big chunk there missing, potentially. And again, every, every time this has come up, it's been so cool to, to hear the responses like, oh, you're right, we're not doing that. And what they're not doing is on some level on the way in, they're decelerating on the way in and they're not maintaining their 300 foot throw or 350 or 250 all the way back in to 70 feet to, to that real close pull down distance. Um, when you get someone who's figured that out and has made, learned how to maintain that massive distance into these very short increments and not decelerate one inch of that 300 foot throw, there is a magic that happens. And I've seen this for 30 plus, I've seen it for 40 years because it happened with me. I knew what it was like to truly pull down with full intent of my max distance throw and there is a life and carry on the ball that is second to none. <laughs> and I have seen this for 30 plus years of teaching this. It is night and day, the explosiveness in life that is gained from training to not decelerate on your way back in. And there's, an, there's this irony, this is a nuanced thing, but there is velocity lost from an arm that goes out to these great distances, but does not know how to pull down correctly. So that was a really long answer, but I hope that shines some light on it too. So you're saying that that they, you think that there's let up? I mean, is that, is that what you're saying? As they come in, they're, they're worried about missing a target or overthrowing or underthrowing. What, what would you 
what what do you think mentally is the thing that leads to that deceleration? It's a hundred percent of two or three things. And this is just, I've seen it my whole life. I've seen it with elite athletes that are learning this for the first time, elite. It's just an art form to do that. I've just learned over the years, it is an art form. I could be in someone's ear and tell them exactly what to do. And they kind of know, they know our program. It's, it's, a, it's a mental hurdle, but when they get it, it's pure magic. And the, the problem with Tim is, is when they come back in subconsciously, what happens is let's say you're at the 300 feet and you've been throwing at 35 degrees angle uphill, right? Well, the closer you get, it's tricky to get the ball back downhill because you're on flat ground. You don't have the benefit of the mound to help you out to get downhill. So you're on flat ground. So it's almost like you're throwing uphill. So getting on top of the ball, which is why we want you crow hopping off your back leg to get some height. But getting downhill is not easy. So what happens again is that players will, as you said, ease up and decelerate because they know subconsciously the ball is going to go over their partner's head. So they'll ease up, they'll, they'll, they'll decelerate. Um, secondly, as you start getting into that 120 distance and in, it, it's just, it's practice. It's just not easy to take a 300 foot throw <laughs> into 120 feet, let alone 90, 80, 70 feet. Uh, when we were with the Rangers in the, in the Dominican, Part of my theory of this, this sort of uphill and a downhill compression explosiveness that was generating more velocity, by the way, it forces you to speed your body up too. A lot of, a lot of other positives come out of this, but really the closer you can get to your partner without hurting them or you know, you know, injuring them, um, the more you're tested of, as to whether you can get this extreme angle uphill into this extreme angle downhill, you have to organize your body in such an unbelievably supportive way you have to sync up so well it's not easy to do this so in the dominican i explained this to the, the coaches down there and what we did is we had and th these guys were going 330 to 350 on average it was beautiful and when we got back in we got them all the way into 60 feet but we geared up the catchers with a face mask so that's the uh, as a son of an attorney that's the disclaimer here is if you come in anything closer to 70 feet gear up a catcher put a face mask on but these guys had the freedom, the mental freedom to let it go because the catchers were geared up with a face mask and these were professional catchers, of course. But to see a 350 foot throw at 60 feet where we're trying to get to the ankle height on the catcher. So think about that leverage. And you think about where do you have to be positionally to take this 350 foot throw 40 degrees uphill and figure out a way to translate that energy out in front without your body beating you, without your head beating you, without your front side pulling out. To me, it's like the epitome of the perfect throw. If you can pull that off, you're, you're gonna put your body in a position to just optimize leverage, optimize explosiveness, learn what it means to get downhill from uphill. This is the magic to me of a, of a really great pull down. So I hope that gives you even more insight, but look, the checkpoint is this, and for anybody else that's uh, interested in this topic, when you get your player to, let's say, 90, 80, 70 feet, and they've been out to whatever they've been out to, and they make a pull down and it looks pretty good, ask them this question. If we would have changed that last throw arc to the arc of your furthest throw today, would it have gone as far as your furthest throw? They will know instantaneously they're in tune they'll go no it would have been at 300 feet it would have gone 260. it's a good pull down it's not a real pull down a real pull down is 300 feet all the way in at that shortest distance and by the way by high or lower the lower you get the more challenged you are to do it but if you do it the payoff is greater So the throws from 200 to 300, those are, there's, you're not looking for distance there as far as during pull downs. You're, you're looking for arch and trajectory to be at gradually going downhill. 
one of the things I've changed in the last 10 years, especially with pitchers on start days, we used to be pretty animalistic on our pull downs. We wanted a player, because look, from 300 feet to, to, to 70 feet, it's 23 throws at 10 feet of throw. It's not that many throws. But where I've changed is I thought, you know what, from 300 feet, especially guys that are out to 350, from 350 or 300 feet into to, to 200 to 180, get on top of it, get through it a bit, but I want them to save some of that juice. And so I, I, I backed off how I feel about the pull downs. So to answer your question, Tim, is yeah, from like 300 to 200, I'd say 80% to stay on top of it. From 200 feet in, I guess the closer you get to your partner, the, the more important the test is to maintain the 300 foot throw. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. It's a great topic. I love talking about, you know, it's funny between pull downs and throwing with arc on the way out the right way, learning how to throw with like a stretch massage kind of arm action. They're two of the most nuanced parts of throwing that I just not talked about much. And they're just a huge deal. Um, just knowing how to stretch your arm out properly, you know, going out slowly with arc and listening to your arm and just going out in these very little increments and, and not knowing what increment you're supposed to be at, what number. So powerful. Ryan, nothing? Yeah, I'm just working. I just feel like I'm, you're like, a, you're challenging me now. I'm just, I'm just figuring out how can I get to Ryan? <laughs> All right, Ryan, before we close down, we're gonna do a little, little chat on breathing, okay? On the mental game, before we go there. Can you give me, Ryan, I'm not, and I'm putting you on the spot. You don't have to answer the question. That a baby. Can you tell me one takeaway from, could you've been a trooper, you've been on all hour and 20 minutes. Can you take, give us one takeaway that really resonated with you about anything that anybody talked about today? Is that, is that a good question? Is that okay? You wanna share? Um, throwing on and off, um, it's been a challenge to figure out, uh, from season to season, getting older and older, throwing more and more to try to gain velo and become an elite pitcher, um, trying to figure out how much I should be throwing and when enough is enough and uh, I need to start ramping down. So that was one of the biggest takeaways for me. Do you feel better now about kind of knowing that? training is sort of king here and that of course we all want to play and get out there on the mound but you just have to be real mindful of, of training and development right yeah cool thank you ryan i love the feedback connor you got anything yeah one of my biggest takeaways from this uh meeting was the importance of what you just talked about, uh, being able to maintain your 350 foot throw, like the effort you're putting into that throw all the way back down to 120 feet to 60 feet. I think that that was a really big takeaway. Yeah. It's, it's, I gotta tell you, of all the things that I've done, at least on the physical side, not necessarily on the, the mental side, that's a different, whole different world. But I gotta tell you, that's why I'm glad Tim brought this up. Talking about pull downs, I, and I'm telling you, I, and this is, there's no ego involved with this. I just did this for a long time, but I had, you know, I had 15 years where I had professionals for eight weeks before spring training. And I was around a lot of really talented players. And when you're around that kind of a, a level of player and aptitude, and, or even including coaches that I've spoken to about this, it's just a, it's fascinating how much nuance is to a real pull down. And, and trust me, I've had to work not in 30 plus years, man. It is, it is rare for me to have a player at any level uh, after I've told them to, hey, maintain the distance of your furthest throw. Let's say we're at 200 feet from 300 feet. And, and they, they do a pretty good job. You know, it's like 89 to 92%, like they're, it looks like a pull down. It looks good. It's got some hair on it. And I'm like, that, that would have only gone 240 feet. Let's try that again. And they, and they understand it. 
and they do it again. And it's better. This time I would have gone 260. And I tell them, and they agree with me. And I'm like, come on. And I explain all the rules. I'm like, look, you can miss 100 feet in front of your partner's feet. There's no, don't, so you don't have to worry about throwing over his head. You can literally aim 100 feet in front of your partner the way you win the game. If you just maintain 300 feet in this effort, I, no matter where the ball, even if it goes over his head, we don't want that. But I'm trying to get you to a point of understanding what it feels like to throw 300 feet at 200 feet and obviously at 150 and 100. And what I have learned for 30 plus years, even with what I think is good and good guidance and giving them all the answers to the test, it's remarkable. It's just an art form. I've learned this. It is an art form to pull this off. If I took 200 pitchers off the street right now and had them do this, I'm telling you, there might be one or two that after one statement of what I just said, will do it right. It, and most of those 200 will take eight to 10 throws to get one right. But when they get it right, and usually you have to, you know, get them kind of competitive, and that usually works. But when they finally do it right, a light goes on that they that they touch a world they've never touched. Even if they throw 95, they've touched a world they've never touched before. And that's why I call it an art form. It's fascinating to see the, the, their eyes light up when they're like, whoa, that was different. So I'm glad, Connor, you, you got something out of that. Um, what I want to do with just a few minutes here, and I know we've been on here a while, so if you have to get off, no problem. But this this could also, this could be the most important part, which begs the question, why was this not the other hour and a half? But um, today we just wanted to really hammer the subject. But we're going to do a, a, a five-minute breathing exercise. We're going to talk about it. What does this have to do with life? What does this have to do with performing better on the field? Um, and then we'll say our goodbyes, okay? So if you guys can hang in there for just a few minutes, I think you'll really enjoy this. Again, this could be something that can be impacting in life, okay? So here's what I'm gonna have you do. And I'm gonna guide you through it so you don't have to worry about thinking about a lot right now. I'm just gonna have you sit back and comfortable. And I'm just gonna have you count your breathing. So as an example, you're gonna do like an inhale is one, and an exhale is two, inhale is three, exhale is four. What I want you to do is count your breath, but here's the trick. I want you to see if you can let your breath create the pace. Excuse me, so what I mean by that is, your inhale and exhale is going all day long whether you realize it or not, right? So it's already happening. So what I want you to do is, can you watch your breath dictate the pace just like it would anyway? Now, it can get a little tricky when you're watching your breath. You're going to feel like you want to influence it. But I'm going to, what I want you to do is not influence it. So I want you to sit back, relax, and just go, okay, when's the inhale? Oh, there it is. There's a one. And wait. Believe me, your exhale's coming. And when it comes, that's a two. And then wait. And that inhale is going to come back as a reflex. Trust me. That's a three. And then you're going to wait for the exhale. That's a four. And just see if you can count to like 20 or 30 without losing track. Um, I'm going to give you a minute or two for some silence. I'm not going to say anything. And then you'll hear me cue you one last time to kind of bring you out. And you'll hear me cue you and you'll know it. It'll be very straightforward. And this will just take five minutes. And then when that's done, we'll just do a little bit of feedback and, and then we'll be good. Okay. So um, any questions? And don't worry, because I'm going to lead you. All right. So let's do the first things first. Uh, most of you look like you're comfortable. If you're not, make sure you get into a comfortable position. Ryan, you got a nice chair there. Maybe, maybe lean back on the chair. How's that? And then what I'd like you to do is just close your eyes if you, if you don't mind. If you don't want to, that's fine. That a boy, Steve. And what I'd like you to do 
is I first just want you to notice what is holding you in place. So if it's the chair, just notice, this is interesting. This chair is doing all the work for me. If this chair wasn't here, I'd hit the ground like a ton of bricks. So I first want you to get the feeling of letting go. Let the body just sink into the chair. Let the chair do the work, so to speak, okay? And again, I want you to get that visual and that feeling. If the chair wasn't there, you would just literally fall through space. You'd literally just go right to the ground like a sack of potatoes, okay? And the last thing is, is that I just want you to notice if any thoughts come in the mind, they're not right or wrong, they're not good or bad. Just let the thoughts do whatever they want. Just imagine they're like little birds flying across the horizon. And if you keep watching the birds, eventually they just sort of disappear. So we can let the thoughts do whatever the thoughts want to do, okay? Because our focus is just the breath. So at this point, what I'd like you to do is I'd first like you to just notice your breath. You don't have to count it yet, but I want you to sort of get acquainted with it. And just check in with it. And just maybe notice if your breath is slow or medium or fast. You may notice that the breath makes a sound or is quiet. You may notice that the exhale is longer than the inhale or vice versa. So I'm asking you to really be like the best private investigator now of your breath. Just check out your breath. It keeps you alive 24 hours a day. So it's probably pretty important. And then what I'd like you to do is when you feel the next inhale come as an instinct all by itself, just notice the inhale. And I just want you to count the number one. You can visualize a number one on a screen. You can actually pretend like your whole body's a number one. And then when you release the breath on the exhale, just same thing, just visualize a number two or count the number two. And remember, we're letting the next inhale come back as a reflex. So we're not trying to manipulate it. The way I like to say this is the breath is breathing you. And the next exhale, even though I'm probably behind you is a four. And so I'm gonna just be quiet now. And I just want you to just stay with the count the best you can. And just even get to 20 or so or 30. And the whole objective again is to let the breath dictate the pace. And if any thoughts or distractions come up, it's no problem. Just keep coming back to your count. You don't win or lose if a thought comes up. Just come back to the inhale or the exhale. And I'm just gonna let you be for about another minute or so and just stay with this count best you can.
So at this point, what I'd like you to do is just start to maybe finish up the exercise. So maybe just take a last couple of breaths and just finish up your counting. Or if you're not counting and you're just sort of chilling out, that's great too. And then what I want you to do is just sort of gently open your eyes. And when you do open your eyes, just, just continue sort of to stay in this nice, comfortable state. Your eyes just happen to be open. So the way I'd like to sort of finish up tonight is if anybody wants to share any feedback. And what I mean by that is if you think about eight minutes ago, where your mind was at, and maybe just a few minutes later doing a little breathing exercise, just to, if there was any diff, any change, any contrast when you opened your eyes. Because usually that's the first sign that, and really usually it's, it's a, it's a very, could be a very powerful sort of level of awareness that Wow, for five minutes I did that and I feel this way. So does anybody want to share? That was a very short session. Usually I like to do sessions for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, Connor, fire away, buddy. Yeah, so at my uh, junior college, we did this thing called mindfulness. I'm pretty sure that this is what it, what, this is what it was. And whenever I'd get done with it, I'd always feel a calmness or a reassurance that everything's just calm and I just feel for lack of better words I just feel great and I'd feel aware of everything that was going on around me it it was just calming and I'll add one thing to that we'll get to Tanner which is one of my favorite lines comes from a, a friend of mine a teacher named Dr. Shana Shapiro and the line is you become what you practice and it's five of the most important words I've ever heard in my life because it's like if you want to be calmer, more relaxed, more clear-minded, less stressed, it would make sense if you did something every day to practice that, you get better at it, right? So that's why I feel like mental practice is absolutely one of the single most important principles, practices in life. And it's probably one of the most, I don't want to use the word neglected. I would just say it's just one of the most undiscovered. <laughs> um, but naturally, it's getting more mainstream. And the fact that you're doing it at your junior college, a lot more programs out there are doing it for sure. Um, you, know, you hear about LeBron James or Shaq O'Neal or, or Tom Brady, or you, know, you hear about all these people that are meditating now and uh, Derek Jeter. I mean, there's just countless countless athletes. Iga Schweitek, who's the number one tennis player in the world, female tennis player. She hasn't lost since February 16th. And there was such a cool shot of her meditating before her semifinal match um, or quarterfinal match. But, uh, but anyway, I'm glad you shared that, Connor. And I, I hope you continue to make that part of your practice so that you can become that part of you that you would want to be more and more, right? Tanner, love the Hello. Thing. When I was trying to follow my breath and uh, count it when it was like when I was inhaling and exhaling, I feel like I couldn't feel myself breathing, maybe because I was thinking like so much about counting like that I wasn't breathing. And it gave me a sort of anxiety and like I try to meditate every day for the past like two years and like I really like it but like I feel like I'm getting anxiety when I'm trying to follow my breath and I feel like every day I'm not really breathing and I'm getting like really skinny and like I don't know I just don't feel like healthy healthy from meditating this way no just like overall like I, I feel like my breathing is messed up you mean physiologically you're not breathing as well as you could? Yeah. 
couple things. One is I do a form of meditation that is called open focus. And what open focus means is that you're, you're more in tune with expansion. So you're doing the opposite of what we just did. For people that usually start out with meditation, having a focal point, like counting or, or a, a mantra or a sound can be very helpful because their mind they may have a lot on their mind. So this is usually like a starter way. But ironically, I prefer not doing this kind of, this is called narrow focus. So number one, we've discovered with you already that you want to be more an open focus. Um, as far as your breath being messed up, I would just say that um, whatever way that you're meditating that you're finding helpful, I would just continue to do and just know that your breath is going to auto-regulate the right okay. way. And I'll tell you something else you said that's interesting. Some of my deepest meditations I felt like I haven't breathed for a minute or two at a time. There's actually a term, it's called, um, I can't quite remember, but it's, it's called like hyper relaxation. And from what little I've learned about this is it's like your body's most heightened or, or most um, optimal state because your body's able to have this optimal rest and, and things can kind of reset and you're just giving your body a break and the fact that your body doesn't need the breath is a sign that um you're okay so okay. i would say i would say maybe play with doing some exercises where you watch your breath more to work on breathing exercises for instance maybe you want to expand your inhale maybe you want to lengthen your exhale because that can really help your breath get a lot better Okay, and you can, go, you can go to YouTube and put in like breath work exercises. There's countless. So even though I know you don't really want to watch your breath for other reasons, I would say investigate some breathing exercises just to help your breath get fuller, deeper, richer, because your breath, as you know, is so powerful. Um, but at the same time, maybe if you're just meditating, and you're not worried about your breath or anything else, do it, do what you're doing that's getting you into a good state. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Because I feel like when I'm trying to think about the breathing, that's forcing me to like think, which is exactly what I don't want to do. Yeah. Go go into the other route. Just go to where you're not thinking and you're just you're just free, free flowing, right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just do that. I just was saying that you might do some breathing exercises more, some breathe some breath exercises more as an exercise in deepening or strengthening your, your breath. Does that make sense? Yeah, like just like eight seconds in and then eight seconds out. Yeah, and, and, and it might be more of an exercise than it is a formal meditation, but I'm telling you, if you do those exercises over time, those will tend to turn into some deep meditations too. Because at some point you'll do the counting for maybe a few minutes and then you're going to want to just check out. But yeah. there's, I've done breath work classes where you're, you're doing like for 29 straight minutes, like this kind of, it's an inhale, inhale, exhale. And it's anyway, don't get me started, but, but, but since you're already doing meditation stuff, go to Google, go to YouTube and, and start digging in man because you're you're already on a, in a good place with it right yeah i like it thank you yeah shoot me a dm shoot me a dm and uh and for the rest of you guys just so you know um if you go to youtube or google and you put in jager mental talk or mental training or mental exercises i've got a bunch of stuff free that's online if you forget just dm me and maybe tonight or tomorrow i'll post them on twitter and just sort of reference tonight zoom okay ken you got anything yeah i enjoy this because uh, our baseball team does it every uh free game and sometimes post game but um i just noticed when i focus on my breath that that my breasts actually become less um i don't have to breathe as much so but they get uh, a bigger gap between each and then just everything kind of melts down and and it calms me down, especially before big games. So 
I enjoy this process. I love it, man. Ken, I appreciate you hanging out so late. Um, Connor, anybody? Let's see, we got you, Connor. We got you, Tanner. Um, John, you got anything? And then we'll, we'll turn over to Steve for a, a last shot, shout out. John, are you there? And if not, that's okay. Um, Steve, feedback on the meditation. I, uh, I love it. You know, this guy's been on my, my wrist forever. Um, I'm just starting to get in a little more because my son's getting into it. Obviously, he's in more intense situations on the mound than I, than I am on the mound. I just go out there and talk to people and try to calm them down a little bit and tell them to breathe, right? Um, I, I, uh, I'm getting into it. You know, that you almost put me to sleep there, too. So that's a good thing. You know, I know if I can do that, if I could just check out, um, come out of it, my mind's clear free of anything in it. I'm not, I'm not worried about, I wasn't worried about my list. I had of ideas that we had, you know, I want to make sure we got that done. I was over in a chair relaxing. So I enjoy it. Um, I'm going to probably, I'm going to probably dig into that a little bit more um, just to kind of enjoy life and just be a little freer. You know, what we'll do Steve is we'll, I'll check in with you maybe tomorrow or the next day. I'm going to give you a little five minute breathing exercise and maybe yeah. you can just start, start doing it. And then we'll have some checkups. How's that? Perfect. Love it. Yeah. And that includes everybody else that's been on this call. So, um, you know, we're going to uh, post this probably the next day or two, but um, I, I just so appreciate it. I know Steve does too. Everybody, you know, making time tonight. Everybody's got busy schedules. And uh, it's just been a treat to have this nice, intimate group. Um, I thought a lot of really good stuff came out of it. Um, if you feel like you want to follow up with something, a question, Hit us up on, you know, on Twitter. Just shoot us a DM. Uh, I'm going to try to put those two links up, like I said, tonight or tomorrow on the mental game. Um, but again, what can I say? But thank you for, you know, for, for hanging out. For those of you that uh, we can't see you uh, video-wise, thank you for showing up as well. And uh, like I said, stay in touch and feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions, okay? And Tanner, make sure you reach out to me as far as if you have any other questions about the breathing and anxiety, I want to make sure I can help you out if possible. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again for everything, guys. I'm going to, let me hit the stop record. We're going to do